I hope you're ready to have your mind blown with the greatest health and fitness information on the planet. <laughs> Well, 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 if it isn't you again, it's me. I'm the host of Mikey Likes You. I'm Mikey, who likes, you are you, who is liked. Wonderful system. We've already worked that out. Um, I'm going to talk about some different things today. Um, mostly the importance of diet, rigidity, and how it can end up being your worst enemy. Uh, Voltaire said that perfect is often the enemy of great. And... It's very true. If you get really, really, really consumed by having everything become perfect and you're not someone who's making considerable money doing it, um, oftentimes it'll just come back to bite you in the ass and then you become so frustrated that you end up giving up altogether. And I think the better approach from what I've seen from the people I've worked with and from people I train with, that unless there's going to be some type of competition or, or monetary gain, that you need to try to find staples that you can sustain and adhere to over the long haul, which aren't going to get in the way of you living a normal life. Because once they start to get in between you and living a happy, normal life, then you start to have the psychological kind of roadblocks that are going to lead to overall failure. All right, uh, there's a couple things off the top of my head though that I wanted to get to. First and foremost is the article that I read by a journalist by the name of Roxane Gay. And she wrote an article about The Whale, the movie which recently garnered Brendan Fraser a Best Actor Oscar for his portrayal of a man who's close to 600 pounds at a very, very kind of turbulent point in his life and you get to see through this, what is supposed to be just an, an, an enormous achievement of a performance from Mr. Brandon Frazier. Um, you get to see this man struggle, you get to see the pain, and you get to see him deal with uh, extreme adversity that comes with not only his weight, but also some of the other things surrounding that, uh, his situation with his children, and blah, 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 blah. Either way, I'm sure most of you are at least familiar that this movie exists, The Whale, right? This lady, Roxane Gay, um, she was very upset about this movie and this idea of thinner actors putting on a fat suit to portray an overweight person. Um, she was frankly upset, and I'm judging solely by the words that she wrote, this isn't, I'm not, this isn't um, speculation, that she's upset that Hollywood, by and large, is mostly thin people to begin with. And the more and more I read about this article, because I'm very interested in this idea of fat, or, you know, body tolerance, body acceptance, because I'm not someone who's ever been particularly overweight, but I am someone who's dealt with really debilitating body image issues, um, which I think lead to a lot of people who have problems with food, you know, and I've certainly had extremely difficult problems with food. My relationship with food has oftentimes been incredibly toxic and not very uh, functional. It's rather dysfunctional, to be honest. That being said, I don't ever want to make it seem like I understand what it's like to be someone who's like alarmingly overweight because I think that that comes with it a social stigma and, and ridicule and rejection that I don't know. I don't know. But this lady Roxane Gay was very upset about the idea of saying that, you know, the, the, the theater where the Oscars were held was filled with a bunch of people who are probably taking Ozambic and engaging in a bunch of fad diets in order to look thin, not necessarily for health. And immediately I was struck by the fact that this is not necessarily very good journalism. Granted, this was an editorial. This was right from the start. No one was um, had the wool pulled over their eyes that this was some type of objective article. This was her opinion, right? But I thought, well, that's an awfully terrible thing to say when you probably don't know anybody in that room. Uh, it's an assumption 
to assume, to assume that yes, because they're thin, most by and large, that they're doing it for all the wrong reasons. I, I, you can't say that. It's just like me to say if there was a group of people who were overweight in one theater, for me to just make these glaring assumptions that they are that way for different reasons. And I, you don't know, you don't know. One thing I've learned that is probably beyond a shadow of a doubt that is not really open for debate by any reasonable person is that we don't really know anything. When it comes to the human experience, there are so many factors, so many un incalculable factors that go into someone's experience. We can't sit there and say like, oh, I know exactly why that's happening. I know why they're getting a divorce. You don't know. I don't know. I don't know why they're getting a divorce, which is so why I have really moved so far away from this idea of being a political pundit or current event type pundit, which I was starting to find a lot of success doing in AM talk radio and then on the cable news stations, because I started to realize like I'm, I, I, I'm being forced to make non-nuanced claims about things that I really don't have much knowledge of. Anyway, I, 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 I'm a passionate follower of politics and I'm deeply invested with deep passion with the idea of the, the American system and then how it applies on a global scale. I love it. I love America. I love American history. I love contemporary American history. I'm geeky about it. You know, I can, I can whoop that ass in some, some jeopardy when we're talking about, you know, 20th century American history. <coughs> Pardon me. But I had to steer away from it because I started to make that realization that I, I, I would have to take on this persona of a pundit as opposed to trying to have a nuanced conversation because even though a nuanced conversation, by, by my estimation, was a lot more congruent with how most people are living their lives and how reality really is, it doesn't really drive ratings and it doesn't get people's interests. And if I want to be a pundit, maybe I can get to punditry when it comes to health and nutrition and fitness and training and stuff, because at least there I can stand behind some things that I'm pretty positive are true and I can really dig my heels in. So this lady, Roxanne Gay, is already pointing fingers at everyone in the room for being thin. And she says it gives off a false impression of reality when the average woman in America is size 14 to 16. I'm like, well, what does that fucking matter? Who cares? Are, are you trying to drop a bombshell? that Hollywood is not representative of the average bloke? No shit. When I go to the Laker game, am I under some impression that the starting five of both teams is gonna have some fucking semblance of how normal men look? No, those are God gifted athletic freaks who are mostly close to seven feet tall because they're the best of the best at playing basketball. It's the same thing that I got, and this is not a political statement, this is just my, per, my personal feelings on things. Um, because I watched the Nolan Ryan documentary last night, which is excellent by the way, even if you're not a fan of baseball. Um, and George W. Bush, who was at the time that Nolan Ryan was playing for the Rangers, the owner of the Rangers, President George W. Bush. And I got to thinking like, wow, if he was never president, he really does seem like a really decent guy that is very likable. And I think he got put into a position where he had to do and say things that are pretty unsavory. Um, but <sighs> getting back to my point, I, I had a real real hard time during his administration because there was this narrative, especially coming from powerful Republicans, that there's like, I'm just like you. Sarah Palin would say, you know, I'm just like you. I'm just a hockey mom. I'm not, a, I'm, I'm not some highfalutin. And George W. Bush, would, would, even though he went to Yale, was pushing that same narrative. You know, well, I'm just a regular dude. I just like to drink beer and go back, even though yeah, I think he's an alcoholic. I apologize. I just like to, to, you know, work on my pickup truck and do the, and I got to think, I'm like, what, wait, 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 let's pause. Okay. Christine O'Donnell, I think was the name of this other woman who was running during that time. And she said, you know, I, I'm just like, I'm just an average woman. I'm just your average. And I said, wait a second, you're trying to run the country. I don't want average. 
I don't want the average person. I want someone who is far above average, above average intellect, above average uh, ambition, above average work ethic. That's the people that I want running the country. And when it comes to Hollywood, I don't want average. I want extremely charismatic, oftentimes beautiful by traditional standards. But if you're not beautiful, I want you to have an interesting character filled look. I don't want you to be the average guy or gal that you look at and you go, whoa, I feel like I've seen that guy a million times or that dude a million. You know, it looks just, just like my friends when I head on down to the bar. That's not the point. It's entertainment. And we like to look at just like I am a pretty darn good. I'm, a, I'm an above average guitar player. But when I listen to metal or classical music, I don't want guitar players kind of close to me and my abilities. I want exceptional. I want to go, wow, this takes me to another place. It's, it's amazing what this artist is capable of achieving. And she further down in the article starts to say, putting on a fat suit is not the same thing as a shared experience of someone who's had to live their life overweight and it's insulting, it's fat phobic to have a thinner actor portraying an overweight person. And I thought, well, no. At the beginning of my statement, I made it very clear. I don't know the, the hardships of someone who is uh, aggressively overweight. I don't. But I know what it's like to be a drug addict and an alcoholic and never once have I seen someone on film or on television portray it excellently and thought to myself, great job, great job, Nick Cage, Ryan Gosling, off the top of my head, uh, a Joaquin Phoenix. But because I know, I know you're not really an alcoholic, you don't get it. Therefore, you shouldn't be able to portray this character. Only Anthony Hopkins and uh, Ian McShane, a couple other people who are like openly in recovery, only they can, can do this because they, they understand this experience. No, that's what acting is. It's pretend. And you take emotions and feelings deep inside you and you're able to apply them to this character to bring it more and more to life. And it's preposterous and it's such aggressive victim mentality to say like, well, since you don't, you didn't experience this in real life, you should, it precludes you from doing it on screen. It's insane. An athlete in any sport who had to work really hard just to be able to get to the point where they can make money doing their love, their, the sport that they love. They're, they're, they're not granted the ability to say, you who's just so gifted, you never really had to work as hard as me. You don't know what it was like to be cut from a team because you're so incredibly naturally talented. Your leaping ability, your speed, your fast switch muscle is so much far superior to me, the guy who, or the gal who had to grind it out. You don't get it, so therefore this isn't for you. No, it's for whoever can do it the best. And to say that Brandon Frazier shouldn't be able to do his Oscar winning performance because he is not someone who has been 600 pounds takes away the amazing experience of other people who are maybe potentially overweight who look and watch that movie and go maybe he didn't maybe he's never experienced this in particular but man he gets it because it elicits an emotion inside of me that wants to bring tears to my eyes and I go good amazing I watched Half Nelson a hundred times Ryan Gosling film I'm gonna say 2007 ish somewhere it's 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 been a while Anthony Mackie, Ryan Gosling, and uh, Omar Epps' um, young, uh, younger sister, ex exceptional performances all around. And Ryan Gosling plays a crack-addicted uh, grade school teacher, <coughs> junior high school teacher, I apologize. And he's crack-addicted. And there are times when his portrayal is so spot-on 
as someone who smoked lots of crack, that it is, it, it, it's transformative for me. I can't just watch this movie like I would watch a comedy or a romantic comedy and go, this is fun, this is it. I, I, I become really moved by it. All the while I know Ryan Gosling, I'm going to bet you dollars to donuts, has never actually smoked crack. There's not one piece of me that goes, well, shit, this movie is malarkey. Because me, as a drug addict, I know he doesn't know what it's really like. Therefore, this performance is, is, is moot. That would be crazy, wouldn't it? You know who's experienced in just an unbelievable amount of pain and suffering? Sex workers. Yeah, sex workers. Especially female ones. It's just probably an, a, a living nightmare. And I'm so sympathetic to their struggle. My wife, who's an actor, has been a sex worker like 10 times on screen. It's kind of concerning. I wonder like, well, how much scrimmaging had to go on for her to be this good come game day. But either way, my wife has played in comedies and in more serious roles she has played. Stripper slash prostitute slash sex worker in, in many forms. And uh, I don't think she had to go walk the streets or become an escort or an exotic dancer to understand that this is probably a painful life. Do you get what I'm saying? You are digging that victim hole so deep. In an attempt to get people to have sympathy, to be empathic to you and your suffering. And what you're doing now is just creating this bubble over you where it starts to detach people from having that ability to connect with you because it sounds just so immature and so spineless. And then, later on down in the article, she says, and I haven't seen this movie, nor will I. And I, <laughs> you're writing an article critiquing and pooping on this man's performance and this film, but you haven't seen it. What, where are we living now? What reality is this? In what world do we tolerate someone critiquing artwork when they haven't seen it? Because I can tell you, not that long ago, if someone wrote an article and was just providing scathing critique about something, anything, and then he or she said, and by the way, haven't seen it, don't really know it, but this is how I feel. I f it would be like Salem, which they might burn that person. So I'm not trying to make a, 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 this, this really in-depth takedown of Roxanne Gay. I'm sure she's very talented. Now, this is not what I'm trying to say, but it is representative of something that's going on an awful lot nowadays where people can just ap apply feelings which we can all probably agree are pretty misguided sometimes. You have reactionary kind of effects that go on. When something happens because of the way your life has gone, something will happen and then your left brain kind of shuts off and you have this internal animal reaction to it. And that, by the way, is super valid for you. But that is not the basis of providing critique, opinion, or ideas.
and it shouldn't be taken as valid. I feel like fill in the blank band. There's a couple, there's a, a couple dozen are horrible. So, okay, I won't listen to them, but I'm certainly not going to go and write about it and tell other people how, how insensitive it is for them to make this music that is kind of offensive to me. And artwork should always be looked at through the same prism. I, uh, since I've moved here to Texas, I, uh, uh, my friend network is almost, is very largely made up of veterans and active duty military. And some of their stories are breathtaking. The bravery, the courage, the, the, the fear that they had to deal with, and then also just the trauma and, and, and how nightmarish it can be for these men and women. Uh, does that make Saving Private Ryan or Platoon just invalid because most of the people in that movie had not served in the military, especially not overseas and in war. If we're going to make any type of war movie right now, if we're going to make any type of movie portraying a, a, a United States military officer, is Adam Driver supposed to, is he the only guy that can do it? I'll bet you one thing, Adam Driver himself probably wouldn't agree to that because he looks like, no, no. I mean, yes, thank you for appreciating my service. And by the way, Adam Driver, you're a great guy and uh, an immensely talented actor. And thank you so much for your service. But he's a professional actor and a good one at that. And he probably realizes like, oh, guys who have uh, dealt with adversity probably can understand what it might be like to me. And maybe if they want to talk to me, they can get some idea of someone who's actually been in those shoes and then apply it to creating this character and giving it realism. Uh, I don't know if you know this, Christian Bale, not a pompous billionaire who fights crime at night in a bat suit. He's not really that, I don't know if you know this, not real. That's not who he is. He's a dude. Also, Christian Bale, not a, uh, not a Wall Street guy in 1987 who's so superficial that he doesn't have any feelings and any kind of visceral connection to other human beings, so he goes around killing them. That, it's not, that's not who Christian Bale really is. Cut this shit out, man. Cut this shit out. Next thing I want to talk about. I went on this rant the other day on this podcast about how kids aren't, they don't know how lucky they are about uh, when it comes to beating off because porn is amazing and it's right there, instantaneous. Boop, you could, and I had to deal with horrible stuff to try to get my rocks off. And, you know, I made it abundantly clear earlier in this podcast that I'm a drug addict and in recovery and an alcoholic. Uh, so I don't use drugs or, or buy them or mostly alcohol either. I don't buy that often. But I was talking to some kids the other day, kids, you know, early 20s. And they were talking about, because I flew back to Los Angeles because my grandma passed away. Thank you. I know she lived, she was 95 and she didn't die suffering in any way. What else can you ask for? But I loved her and it was tough. And I really just felt bad for my mom. It was her mom. So uh, I go back and I'm talking to these dudes and they were talking about how they go to a dispensary to get their weed and they can just choose between all these different weeds. And I was like, you don't know how lucky you are to just go buy weed at a store with employees who are paid to be there and help you because when I used to buy weed, I had to put up with some fucking assholes to get it. All drugs will surround you, including marijuana. All drugs will surround you with people you probably don't want to be around. That's, that's a given because drug culture will do that. None worse than meth. Meth surrounds you with people that you, you just don't want to be around. Um, but even weed, 
on a much lower scale will put you around people that you don't like. But if you have a, an, an edifice, a building where you can go and legally buy it, it takes out a lot. I one time used to go buy weed from this dude who was white with dreadlocks. Now you're already on thin ice there, but I know white men and women with dreadlocks that are actually pretty sweet. Okay. Zach De La Rocha comes to mind. Petros Papadakis used to have a nice head of dreadlocks. I love Petros. But, you know, you're, you're, you're peeking into territory where you're like, what's with... And he was that guy. And he loved reggae, hence the dreadlocks. I appreciate reggae. I think it's a fantastic form of music. But he would constantly try to force me to understand that it is the supreme form of music. Which is where I got real... Real surly, real quick. Also, his living girlfriend had a fucked up face. And I don't mean that she was unattractive. I mean, something happened. Either she was born with a defect or like some extreme hair lip. But she, there was something there, right? But she was an obsessive WNBA fan. I greatly appreciate some of these WNBA athletes, and I think that they're awesome. But she, well, in between her boyfriend trying to tell me that Ica Mouse is better than the Beatles, would also try to tell me that actually WNBA players are far superior than NBA players, and most people don't understand that. And if you don't understand that, it's because you don't really understand basketball. And... I had to sit there and watch, you know, three quarters of a Sparks game with Yellow Man bumping in the back and both of these assholes da, 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 in my ear just so I could get an eighth. Just so I could get an eighth of weed. And you can go to a store that's air conditioned and pick out your weed, which is all just dank and go, OK, thanks. Peace out employee who's trying a good job trying to do a good job and getting money to do it and is probably leaving me alone unless i need help in which case he or she is going to help me fuck you just don't take it for granted man man another thing before i get to fitness stuff <laughs> go to cvs Pharmacy, right? You need to buy eye drops. I love it here in Texas. But something about the, the biosphere of Texas, something about the, the, the environment here really irritates me. And I, I do have asthma. It's not so bad. I don't really have, I know some people have asthma. Debil I don't have a debilitating asthma, but I have asthma. And Los Angeles being a desert really seemed to suit me well. But something about the transition here with the humidity and the way the trees and the plant life here. It's, and also, look, I, I handle goats and sheep all day and dogs and cats. And I'm probably just got a bunch of hair and pollen. Anyway, I need eye drops every once in a while. So I go to get eye drops, right? And I, get, and I put them up. And he, this guy behind the counter, really young guy, probably teenage um, but very nice. He starts talking to me. And he has a very unique kind of accent. It sounded, because I grew up in the 626 in the San Gabriel Valley, it sounded very Chinese to me. It sounded like a native uh, Mandarin speaker trying speaking English, right? But this guy was like blonde, like Aryan, blonde blue eyes, okay? So I go, wow. I go, wow, dude. Uh, that's a very unique um, accent you have. I, do you mind me asking where that's from? And he goes, with a kind look on his face, oh, I had my trachea crushed in a football game. I don't have an accent. I had my trachea crushed in a football game, so now I talk like this.
And I responded just like I'm responding right now, like this. And then after about that level of silence, that, that, that length of period of silence, I said, I'm really sorry. It's okay. I just wanted to tell you that. Because I was just trying to be a nice guy. And I was genuinely curious about where he came from. But he came from my throat's been crushed land. So on to the fitness and the health. I think that, you know, Instagram and YouTube and TikTok and everything has driven people to be a, a little bit more interested and a, a lot more motivated to try to be active, right? And take care of themselves, both eating and with training. The problem is, is that most of the people that get traction, I mean, I guess this isn't a problem, but it ends up in the long run becoming some type of problem. The problem with that is that most of the people putting out this information that gets people motivated are fucking shredded and oftentimes young and oftentimes on drugs. And also, uh, I can tell you firsthand as someone who puts out fitness media in an attempt to make money off of said media, that if you're not putting out something kind of elaborate, different, or creative, it doesn't pique people's interest as much, and therefore you can't get as much kind of engagement and subsequently money. What this does is that it gives people far too much to shoot for and makes people far too strict and aggressive with their training plans and with their diet subsequently leading to them falling off completely because it's not sustained. That's not sustainable. What is sustainable to young drug using person is really not sustainable for a lot of people. And frankly, I'm for, I just turned 44 and what's sustainable for me as a guy who's been training pretty hard for 20 something years is not sustainable for most young people who are not on drugs. You got to take into consideration all the factors that go into it, okay? And if you're not matching recovery and diet to training, if there isn't a concerted effort to put the two to move and live in, in symbiosis, you will shoot yourself in the proverbial foot. In fact, there's a big, there's a much bigger downside, a much bigger, much bigger downside. I know this sounds crazy, but there's a much bigger downside to overshooting your training than being a little bit under training. If you leave a little bit in the tank, but you're consistent and, and kind of progressing and trying to make a prolonged effort, but doing it just underneath the threshold of what you're capable of, it might not be optimal as hitting it on hitting that nail on the head, but it's a lot better than overshooting it even by a little. You got to think of the hormonal factors that go into that, the lifestyle factors that get in the way. Okay? And then uh, at the end, it all kind of funnels into the psychological factors that go into it. Overtraining will lead to whether it's gross overtraining, if you're getting rhabdomyolysis or whatever, or if it's just kind of that pervasive, ubiquitous train overtraining that just goes on for on, on and on and on, which is far more common. E either way, it's going to lead to hormonal internal kind of situations that you're, that are not favorable to you being anabolic or anaketabolic. Your met your metabolism is not helped out by this. And then on top of that, it makes you starving and it makes you starving for all the wrong types of foods. If you're not engaging in a sport where there's power endurance or long-term aerobic endurance involved, this is exactly why I say like, there's really no need to engage in cardiovascular activity. And if you do it, do it really judiciously because it pushes you over the edge and it gets you hungry for all the wrong stuff 
like really uncontrollably hungry. And it also puts you in a different hormonal setting that isn't going to be favorable to you looking in the mirror and being happy with what you see. And on top of that, people get so, so consumed with constructing this unrealistic, perfect training plan that, you know, with the narrative of more is better. That they oftentimes end up training themselves into terrible diets. And I can tell you very, very clearly, I want to re reiterate this a million times over. If you're a guy staring at the side of your chest and there's like fat pockets there, <clears throat> if you're a woman who sees like your, your, you know, some nalgas in the back between your upper, upper hamstring and your, and your glutes, and you're like, I'm not happy with this. I want to change this. The, what you're eating and how much of it is far more important than your training. Of course, training is a factor and I want it to be a factor for everybody. But when it comes to looking in the mirror and getting what you want out of that experience, your diet is really your ticket. So that being said, you need to establish your dietary needs first and then train to that, as opposed to what almost all people do before they've made this mistake for far too long and they train, 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 and they just push themselves and then kind of make the diet just fit around how that is because that's going to be what most people think when they watch the Rocky montage and they watch the fill in the blank Hollywood actor do a behind the scenes video of how they trained to get to this role where they look amazing. And it's just like this, these, these different, you know, this patchwork of all these training kind of things of people sweating like balls and stuff. Um, and the reality is, is if you don't take into deep consideration your eating first, that type of training, the montage training that catches people's eyes is going to drive you into eating four pizzas and washing it down with six pack of beer. Not the good six pack, the bad six pack. <laughs> um, So that's something that I kind of wanted to go over and I wanted to break it down a little bit. So when I say try to set up your diet and then train to fit that as opposed to going in the opposite direction, what are some of the tenets that you need to look out for first? Well, regardless of what type of diet you find is easiest to adhere to. I genuinely want to say, don't be too strict. Don't go into this mode like Dwayne The Rock Johnson, who is amazing and he, and he looks great. But Dwayne The Rock Johnson is Dwayne The Rock Johnson and he makes dozens and dozens of millions of dollars with every movie he makes and part of it's based on his physique. So if he wants to eat 95% of the time in this perfect controlled fashion, by the way, I talked to um, co-stars of his various co-stars of his, who have been in small parts or they've been in larger ones. And they say, oh, and he's got people on set bringing him the food measured and there, you know, and here's the shrimp and, and the, you know, white rice and everything. So that's not realistic for the average bloke. But you do have to understand that going in that route where you're perfect 99% of the time and then having these extreme cheat days is going to be really counterproductive for most people. I understand it works for The Rock. I understand it works for Sylvester Stallone in 1986. It doesn't work over the long haul for the average person. Whereas if you were to say, I'm just going to eat the foods day in and day out that I know are good for me and I know are good at helping me achieve my goals. And then if the pizza shows up once in a while and the cake shows up on my birthday and my wife's birthday, whatever, I will have that till I'm content and then I will get right back on that horse. With no end date, with no kind of concrete metric of I have to be this body weight or this body fat by tomorrow or by this date, you just live in a, in a more positive direction. That becomes sustainable. And then also not having in your head this famine mentality of like, 
I can never eat donuts again. I can never eat ice cream again. I can never eat fill in the blank, you know, pasta. Once you create that idea in your head and you're not doing it for a very clear purpose, like a bodybuilding show or a photo shoot or making millions of dollars. If you're just doing it to do it, that creates that psychological uh, kind of that landscape where you become almost like an alcoholic early on in sobriety. Where you, I, I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this. Um, and I will tell you the kind of old adage of one day at a time when it comes to drugs and alcohol is beautiful. And it's hard. And you got to just think, I can't, I'm not thinking about the rest of my life. I'm thinking about today. I got to get through today, whatever I can do to not have a drink, whatever I can do to not have, and I, and I'll, I have my network of people and I have the, the, uh, this, the, the network around me to help me, blah, blah, blah. That's not a way to go about food because food is something that's essential for your existence. And you're going to have to eat. It was very easy for me to just say, I'm not alcohol, drugs, no more because it's not vital to my survival. Quite, quite the opposite is true, but food, it's not how it goes. So you can't create this idea where there's these strict boundaries around yourself because although it may work for a while, it only works till it doesn't. And once that dam breaks, it's usually a disaster. It is usually a serious flood with fatal attacks. So my ideas are to look and create these kind of soft boundaries. Instead of creating, actually, instead of creating boundaries, just lay a nice road down in front of you. And what is in the asphalt of that road, in my opinion, is finding the exact amount of calories that are good for you to achieve your goal. Finding a high, super high amount of protein, probably higher than you're thinking. And adhere to that. And know that this is the way I'm eating now. And your fat and your carbs can just kind of fluctuate. It is flexible. And it is flexible to whatever best suits you. If you're working in an office and you don't engage in any kind of high intensity activities outside of trying to look better, then cut your carbs if that is easier for you. Certainly fat and protein are much more satiating and they will make it easier to adhere to a caloric kind of deficit because they're filling and they're usually more satisfying. If you're someone who is engaging in a lot of intense activity outside of just what you're doing to look better, you want to consider bringing the fat down a little bit and upping your carb level so that you can have some glycogen in your system when you go to engage in said higher intensity activities. <coughs> You know, so outside of that, once we start getting into really decorating that road that you're laying down with higher protein and caloric set points that are best suited for your goal, then you're starting to get into the weeds a little bit. And that's the point when I say you need to look to someone who's really done it before to get, you, to, get to help you. Excellent, excellent segue. But if you would like that, uh, the top tier of my Patreon is available to you. I'm starting to really... I've always enjoyed it, and I've always been in insanely grateful to all of my patrons, but lately it's just been really firing on all cylinders. There's just like four or five people that I, you know, they say these things to me that I go like, wow, it's meaningful. I finally feel like I have control over the way that I'm eating, and I finally feel like I, I get it where I'm happy and I, and I can, I, I'm in control of food instead of vice versa. And I was like, oh man, I'm, I haven't been this thin since college. And I can't believe like I used to train so much more and that I'm training now, you know? So, uh, you know, the, 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 I'm there, but I'm not saying you have to use me. I, I'm open to it. I would love to work with most anyone, but there's plenty of really smart men and women out there. I'm saying once you get past that, 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 kind of important framework of like setting your calories, understanding where it is to best suit your goal and then upping your protein. <clears throat> if you need more guidance, look to someone who's really done it before 
and get their help. All right. I'm going to come at you with a new episode after this one. Pretty close to back to back because there was a big space between me making this one and my last episode because I had some farm disasters and my wife and my daughter went out of town. So I'm alone and I had to take three or four days to fly into L.A. as I talked about before because my my beautiful grandma passed away. But I'm going to come back at that ass early next week with another episode where I'm going to start giving a little bit more uh, insight onto some of the stuff that we talked about today when it comes to setting up that diet and also breaking away from the rigidity that you think you need. All right. In this crazy mixed up world that makes you think that nobody cares. Remember one thing I do be good.